Her Excellency, the Most Honorable Dame Sandra Mason, delivered the President's speech on Friday, February 4th, ushering in the first meeting of the first session of Parliament, 2022 to 2027. But what is the function of Parliament, and what is expected from those who occupy spaces within those hallowed walls? Very good evening to you. I'm Lisa Lord. And my special guest this evening is a former Deputy Speaker of the House of Assembly and a veteran attorney, Mr. Ezra Ali. Mr. Ali, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, ma'am. So I want to start out very basic. I want to look at our parliament, which is the third oldest in the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. And what is the role of the Parliament of Barbados? In a sentence to pass laws for the better governance of the country. That is its basic function. And really, that is what it was created for, what it lives for, and what it does, to pass laws. But the Parliament consists of the lower house, the upper house, and the presidency now. And, and we'll get into that. And, and I know that you cannot separate Parliament and the Constitution. So explain to viewers, if you will. Well, some people try to separate it, but... Parliament was created, this Parliament was created by the Constitution. Now, we've had a Parliament for, if you like, donkey's ears, centuries. This Parliament is created by our Constitution. And the Interpretation Act says that, the Constitution says that we have a Parliament which is now created by this Constitution the constitution in which we got in 1966. Let's look at the structure of parliament. Yeah. Um, you have the House of Assembly or the lower house. The lower but more powerful house. And the Senate or the upper chamber. But less powerful house. So explain to me both houses of parliament. The lower house is an elected house, very important. The people elect the members of that lower house. They do not elect the members of the upper house. They are selected or nominated. So there's a substantial difference because the power resides in the lower house. And in numbers that make up both houses? 30 in the lower house, 21 in the upper house. Let's go into the more powerful house. Yes. Let's look at the members of parliament. What is the role of a member of parliament? Depends on what he is doing. Strictly speaking, he's there to represent the people who put him there, who elected him. But... If he's a minister, he has another role. That role is to assist in managing and governing and doing things for the betterment of the country. But he's also a representative. So he has to fulfill these two roles. A role as a member of the executive, i.e. the cabinet, and also a genuine elected representative. Let's look at the power of the executive, the cabinet. Extraordinary and awesome power. They can do virtually anything within the Constitution. Um, law is such a powerful instrument that if the cabinet proposes that a law be passed, and if, as in small parliaments like our parliament, the numerical strength of the cabinet, as represented in the lower house, outnumbers the remainder of the non-cabinet members, then what the cabinet says can easily become the law, notwithstanding any criticism from the back bench. At Westminster, it's different. Mm -hmm. You have a cabinet which is totally outnumbered by the four or 500 other members of the back bench. And Boris Johnson is experiencing that problem right now as we speak. The back bench can effectively remove the cabinet, remove the prime minister and Normally, when the prime minister is removed, the government will fall. Or normally, um, the government should fall. But in some instances, it doesn't happen. But generally speaking, it is the prime minister's commission from the head of state to form a cabinet and manage and run that cabinet for the betterment of the country. You spoke about the 
House of Assembly being a very powerful chamber. Yes. However, we also saw the power of the Senate, especially when it came to integrity legislation. Yes. So the Senate obviously has its place as well. Yes, it is not the more powerful house, but in a written constitution situation such as ours, the framers were wise enough to draft the constitution in such a way, <clears throat> excuse me, that the government has a built-in majority in the Senate, but not a sufficient majority mm -hmm. to pass entrenched provisions in the constitution. So in our instance, the government or any government in the Barbados situation has to get 14 of the senators supporting constitutional amendments that upset or deal with entrenched provisions. And therefore, in that sense, the Senate is a break on runaway constitutional amendments. It can restrain and prevent the government from amending the Constitution in a willy-nilly fashion. Mm -hmm. I think senators, generally speaking, would normally examine the merits of the change. But the fact is that as drafted, the Senate can and does have a restraining influence on runaway constitutional amendments. That is its major power. And in the Senate, there is the government senators, yeah. the independent senators, mm. and then the opposition senators. Yes. Nothing wrong with that. 12, 7, and 2, respectively. The government's 12, independent 7, and two opposition senators. That is our configuration. It may vary in other um, written constitution situations. And I'm going to come back to the Senate, the yeah. topic of the Senate. Mm. But I want to look at some of the functions of some key persons within Parliament. Right. We won't get through all of them on this program. Fair but enough. for instance, the Speaker of the House of Assembly, what is his or her role? Um, to keep order in, in a sentence. But it is an extraordinarily honorable role. Mm -hmm. Very, very important. Deeply rooted in history. Um, established centuries before the office of prime minister. Um, in the days when the king ruled as well as reigned, his man or her man, as the case may be, king or queen, was the speaker. The speaker presided, caught the vote, made sure that there was order, and on occasion reported back to the monarch. When Parliament recently opened, we saw a reenactment of that historical um, truth because His Honor Mr. Arthur Holder, as all of his predecessors did, sought the approbation of the head of state to his election. That is a historical throwback to the honorable origins of the office of speaker and the power of that office. In the United States, for example, the speaker of the House of Representatives still has that power and can upset the plans of the executive, the president, by voting contrary to um, the wishes, requirements, or inclinations of, of the White House. But we've got a different system here. We've brought the executive into Parliament, and therefore we can, if you like, get the legislation through because we have the whip and the numbers. Mm. The United States has a different system. But our speaker comes from a long line of distinguished parliamentarians in the sense that distinguished holders of a parliamentary office in the sense that the speaker really is a very powerful person. Speaker can call on ministers to sit and um, finish their speeches if they are out of order. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen. Um, I'm smiling because when, once when I was deputy speaker, I had the burden of calling on the leader of the opposition, then Mr. Barra, to discontinue his speech at, I think it was 10 o'clock on the morning of a particular debate. At 10 o'clock that same evening, or just about 10, I had the equal burden of calling on Prime Minister Adams to discontinue his speech. 
they were speaking within the confines of the uh, of parliamentary etiquette and so on. But they had both missed a key point, that the time mm -hmm. was shorter mm -hmm. because the standing orders had not been suspended. Right. So that the speaker has power. He has the duty to keep order in the House. The president of the Senate. The president of the Senate is a, a representation, if you like, of the British system in the sense that we have three layers of government, the lower house, the upper house, and in the United Kingdom, the monarch. Now, when we replicated that here, we had a governor general. The moment we became a republic and cut every single legal and constitutional tie, mm -hmm. we have a president mm -hmm. who is in every respect vis-a-vis -vis other heads of state on par. Um, I like the notion of becoming a republic because we can and have managed our affairs totally without reflection or looking backward towards some other person. Um, we've done that for years, centuries. Mr. Barrow always said that we were not a granting aid colony. We paid our way and we've established a sufficient fund of political wisdom and experience that we can run our affairs. Quite frankly, I don't think there's anyone at Westminster who can tell us anything about running a country. We've had throughout the years, both in the Democratic Labour Party and the Barbados Labour Party, such a mix of circumstances rooted in politics, situations that we had to resolve that we've got a depth of experience that I think can match anything that goes on elsewhere, particularly at Westminster. The Clerk of Parliament. I'm sorry? The Clerk of Parliament. Tell me about the Clerk of Parliament. Extraordinarily important people, legally qualified lawyers. They are there to um, advise His Honor the Speaker. Speakers don't have to be lawyers, um, <clears throat> but if they are, it helps, mm -hmm. but the clerks keep the agenda going. They pay attention to everything that is going on because when debates get heated and the speaker has to rule in a moment on whether a member is in order or not, if the speaker is not um, qualified as a lawyer, and even if he is, he draws on the experience, the continuing permanent experience, if you like, of the clerks to advise him. And when Parliament is not sitting, they have an equally important job. They make sure that the records are kept and that everything is in order. And they also advise the Speaker when Parliament is not sitting about things that will occur. They're very, very important people. Um, highly prestigious jobs. We may not regard them so here. People don't quite understand how important they are. But at Westminster, these, these gentlemen and ladies now um, are regarded very highly. They, they have know, to be very meticulous. Oh, extraordinarily so. Mm -hmm. You've got guys who are the clerks of parliament in the United Kingdom, who um, obviously most of them are graduates. We are talking of PhDs and master's degrees. But these guys um, dedicate themselves to knowing virtually everything about the standing orders, um, they appreciate what's happen happening on both sides of Parliament and they know exactly what and how to rule in order to keep the Speaker, um, as it were, on top of his game. And of course, most of the time he's already on top of his game, but everything has to be done so quickly. Mm -hmm. They work long hours, it's demanding work, yes. and they, they have to be there. You have more than one clerk because yes. clearly they have to be in and out. Mm -hmm. It's a very important function. Without it, Parliament, I don't think, can work. Let's look at the standing orders. What are they? The rules, rules of debate. Um, Take us through some. Well, uh, the standing orders are detailed rules. They tell you how particularly, the, no, first of all, they tell you about the agenda, what is, mm -hmm. uh, and how the, businesses to be conducted and the time limits for speaking and so on. 
you have to know your standing orders if you are a presiding officer because it is a strenuous job presiding. Um, if you don't know the standing orders as a presiding officer, members can say things that are unparliamentary mm -hmm. and they get into the record and then the whole parliament, if you like, is demeaned or debased. So you have to know within the standing orders examples of what can and cannot be said. The standing orders may have a general statement, mm -hmm. but then you must know uh, the particulars of that general statement or examples of the particulars so that you can rule a member out of order or say no point of order. And, and many times you would hear the speaker ask for something to be struck from the record. But how easy is it for something to be struck from the record? Extraordinarily easy. You just don't record it. Or when the, um, when the debates are printed, you, won't, you shouldn't see it there. I mean, you can't re recall the spoken word, but you can make sure the spoken word doesn't get into the written record. Now, members of parliament are expected to conduct themselves in a, with a certain level of decorum. Yes. However, from time to time, we have some heated debates. Tell mm -hmm. me about how the speaker deals with instances like those. In an extreme situation, in an extreme situation, you can ask a member to leave and suspend him for the day. But clever presiding officers establish or should establish a modus operandi, a way of operating um, that allows him to control the house without saying a word. How so? You're forcing me to say that I established when I was deputy speaker mm -hmm. um, a technique. I would listen to the debates. I would watch both sides, particularly the person who was speaking. And if I thought that the person was about to stray into forbidden territory, I would simply move my hand towards the microphone. And sometimes they would pick up that I am keeping my ears open mm -hmm. and that I'm about to rule the statement out of order or call upon the member to withdraw. If you can establish that kind of unspoken connection, then you can keep the house in order. Um, one of the most controversial debates occurred when the opposition of the day tried to, well, they did move a motion to censor Speaker Hines. It was a hostile debate. Unfortunately for me, I was in the hot seat. I remember actually perspiring in that air-conditioned chamber by reason of the force of concentration, because it was a hostile debate, and I had willed myself to pay attention to every word. You had on the one side extraordinarily expert debaters like Mr. Barr himself, Mr. Sleepy Smith, um, Mr. Sandiford, an expertly skilled debater in the, on the floor of the house, um, Mr. Branford Tate and others. And on the other side you had Tom Adams, a cut and thrust debater of the highest order, Mr. St. John, Mr. Ford, Mr. Lionel Craig, an extremely clever parliamentary debater. Um, we talk about, um, in constitutional politics, the giants of parliament who are unlettered. Um, you couldn't get a sharper, unlettered debater than Mr. Burton Hines when he was not speaker. Mr. Lionel Craig, Mr. L.B. Baffett, these men had brains of the highest order. And when, for example, Mr. Craig was on a roll, you had to be very, very sharp because his understanding of language is such that he could throw a barb at the other side, which did not seem to be a barb. But the speaker had to be, that 7681 parliament was perhaps the best in terms of the high quality of debate. I mean, you had giants on both sides going at each other's throats in the interest of the debate that was going on and in the interest of exposing every facet of the proposition before the House for the benefit of the public.
these, these guys were sharp. And then on the back bench, we had Johnny Chatham and David Simmons. And these, you had Billy Miller, for example, extraordinary example to young women of how to um, reach for the highest standards of parliamentary uh, behavior and debate. And she was always extremely well prepared. And she gave the then opposition as much trouble as anybody else. Um, we used to say that she had marked out certain members of the opposition for the purposes of advancing her side of the cause and the Barbados Labour Party side of the cause. And they couldn't match her. Um, she gave much better than she got. Beyond. But, but that's the kind of um, cut and thrust that takes place. Mm -hmm. So that every facet of the legislation was looked at. Right. And any mistakes were exposed on the floor of the house. I mean, they were not at each other's throats in a physical sense. Yeah. Because once they were leaving the chamber behind the speaker's chair, a lot of back slapping and so on. Now, beyond asking a <clears throat> member to <clears throat> leave for the remainder of the day, suspending yeah. them, how else are members of parliament um, disciplined? Well, um, they can be suspended for a period of time. Mm -hmm. That is probably the most severe. Um, Has that ever happened? I cannot remember any personal instance, but I'm sure it has. If I were able to search my memory long enough, I could find some instance. But we don't let matters get that bad here in Bab. I've never known it happen here, but perhaps some, um, s some other former parliamentarian can recall such an instance. But suspension for the day has happened. But that's a serious thing. Because and we've had walkouts as well. Oh, yes, but walkouts are political tactics. Mm -hmm. You walk out and create problems. You walk out and you might create a problem of getting a quorum so the government can't do its business. A walkout is a sign that you're dissatisfied with what's going on. It's a protest of sorts, right. a tactical move. Of course, when you walk out, you can't take part in the debate, which is counterproductive sometimes. And a government in response might just get its legislation through in your absence, provided they still have a quorum. But that's the price you pay for walking out. So we'll take a break here. You're watching One on One. Let me begin preparations. It's hurricane season. Let me sit down and reason. Let me secure a nation. Grow your shelters, Bajan. Help out one another, get liberation. Develop emergency community plans so that we could function. Remove outdoor objects. Make sure that you went to the ATM. Stack up with water. Make sure you clean the gutter in. What about ten food? Make sure you got some stock up in your room. Make sure you prop up the pail and tie down the roof. Let me start to prepare real soon. Let me begin preparations. It's hurricane season. Let me sit down and reason. Let me secure a nation. Grow your shelters, Bajan. Help out one another, get liberation. Develop emergency community plans so that we could function. Keep it clean, keep it green. Barbadians, we invite you to get involved and play your part as we clean and green Barbados. Come into your community with media launches, bulk waste collection exercises, community engagement sessions, and giveaways. Get on board. Let's keep Barbados clean and green. Beautiful, beautiful Barbados. And welcome back. Uh, Mr. Aline, before the break, you were talking to me about how speakers of the House are able to discipline members yeah. of Parliament. Mm -hmm. Now, this program is to educate and inform. So I want you to explain the difference to viewers and listeners, mm -hmm. the difference between a bill mm -hmm. and a resolution. A bill ripens into a law because the bill is, if you like, the draft, the draft act. But that also is... Um, bad parliamentary language, if I may put it that way. But the bill ripens into the act. The bill comes before parliament as an indication of what the cabinet wishes to do. 
for example, the Constitutional Amendment Bill, which is now current, comes as a bill. It has a first reading, has a second reading, has a third reading, it goes to the Senate, and eventually it becomes an act. A resolution is a completely different thing. It is um, a way of getting action and approval by Parliament of um, something that the Cabinet wants done. For example, a resolution that X thousand dollars, X million dollars mm -hmm. be placed at the disposal of the minister or what have you, of the ministry to do such a thing. But the resolution is a form of getting the approval of Parliament because after all, it is the people's parliament and it is the people's, if you like, um, business. Um, the best example I can give you of a resolution is the budget mm -hmm. speech. Not that the speech is the resolution, but at the end of the speech, at the end of the debate which follows, that debate follows because of a resolution by the Minister of Finance calling upon the House to either um, approve the government's handling of the economy because the budget is a ministerial statement to which the standing orders will not permit any debate. The resolution gives the House the chance to debate the budget and the speech follows. It's a clever way of getting a ministerial statement debated, but the budget is nothing more than a ministerial, I mean the budget speech. And that is why there is a current debate which says that the estimates constitutionally mandated by Parliament mm -hmm. to be passed before the 31st of March mm -hmm. is in fact the budget. budget. Right. The Chancellor's red bag or black bag or whatever it was, or the Minister of Finance's speech, that is nothing more than a ministerial statement, which cannot be debated according to the standing orders because the Minister is just giving information to the House. Um, that's half the story. There's another half to it. And that is that the from midnight to night mm -hmm. statement, which occurs in the budget, only becomes law because of a special piece of legislation. In other words, laws are made by bills mm -hmm. and not resolutions. Yes. But the mere speech of the Minister of Finance, in the interest of raising uh, money to run the country, he is empowered to enact a law by reason of the Provisional Collection of Taxes Act, which allows him to speak and, so, in so speaking, raise a tax or effectively make law. But he has to come back before the House with the appropriate resolution within a set time frame. So there are these functional dysfunctionalities, if you like, that permit the government to operate. But the basic thing is that all laws are made in Parliament. The bill is laid, okay. it's read, it goes through its stages and then it goes at its way. But you have that major exception. So that people rejoice in or despair of this statement from midnight to night without understanding that behind it, there is a piece of legislation which speaks to the need to do that, contrary to the normal idea that laws are made by parliament and not by a single person. Our constitution hardly permit, in fact, it does not permit anybody to make a law just like that. But ministers or politicians who understand the system can sometimes ensure that beneficial provisions are made into instant um, reality by understanding the rules. Um, I can tell you about one of those um, ways in which you can beneficially um, do what you have to do by understanding the system. Proceed. 
the sales tax in Barbados. Mm -hmm. We're back in 76, I speak from my experience because I don't know of other more recent and better examples. The government of the day wanted to abolish it in the, uh, on the opening of parliament. They wanted to abolish the sales tax. The sales tax obviously is a tax which was enforced by an act. So this was a political move. The new government taken over from the old government wanted to make that political statement that the sales tax, which had created such confusion, if you like, and which was so unpopular, would be gone in keeping with the manifesto promise. But to change an act, you needed to have a bill and three sittings, so it couldn't be instantly done. But clever understanding of the system allowed it to be done because the act being an act, um, like, all, like most acts do, are uh, the parent to subsidiary legislation, mm -hmm. a ministerial order, an order or statutory instrument under the main act. The suggestion was made that what could be done, what was done, was to reduce the rate of the tax to 0%, which could be done on the fiat or the signature of the Minister of Finance. So the speech announced that my government will um, reduce the rate to 0%. So the system is designed to protect the public, but it is also designed to enable a government which needs to get the public's business done in pursuance of political promises, it allows a government to understand the system and to work it in the public interest. Clearly, it was in the public interest to reduce the sales tax to 0% or to abolish it. But if you couldn't abolish the act and you reduce the rate to 0%, same effect. Right. So the system is not designed to disrupt and stop government. It is designed to get the government to work within rules that protect Certain the public objects. interest. Explain to me the significance of the first and second readings of a bill. First reading is literally putting the bill down and notifying the House that the bill is laid. Members can see it. We publish on the website. Ordinary members of the public can download it from the parliamentary website. The second reading is when the minister gets up, speaks to the bill, explains what is going on with it, and deals with the principles which have informed that bill, the action, the decisions, the reason why we need this bill. Then it goes to the committee, which looks at it in detail. It's reported out of committee. You have a third reading, in case there are any amendments. It's passed the third time, goes to the Senate. It sounds simple. It can sometimes be very protracted, especially in committee where you're taking the bill and nitpicking, just going through every word sometimes, changing definition. Members of the opposition can see flaws in the bill that perhaps the draftsman didn't see, or can see things in the bill that require to be ex explained. It is a very detailed um, operation. The chairman of committees is, that is a, an important job rated slightly higher than the job of the deputy speaker in terms at one stage of the salaries because he has a lot he ought to have a lot more work mm -hmm. or she if there's a female chairman because every bill goes to committee we're not talking of um, the kind of committees that um, bring in um, draw in the public we're not getting there yet that's like um, the public, public accounts, accounts committee, which can now, yeah. mm -hmm. we're just talking of the ordinary run of the mill legislation goes to a committee of the whole house sometimes. In larger countries, you have a committee um, populated by a section of the house, but here we take the whole house as a matter of course, and we get the job done because some bills have been improved in committee. Mm -hmm. But that's not we're not talking of the recently announced standing committees because now that is going to be a totally different ball game. We have to wait and see how it works out. But a standing committee is one that is there permanently 
It does not have to deal with particular pieces of legislation in a day-to-day -day fashion. Right. But it can, it might, it depends on how it works. It might have very serious powers. Because you need to have some powers to compel people to come and give evidence before these committees in the public interest. And you work at the Public Accounts Committee. That's generated a lot of public interest in recent years. Are you pleased with how that committee has been functioning? No. Really? A blunt no, because, you know, you could write, one could write a PhD thesis on the malfunction or the function of the Barbados Public Accounts Committee. Let me tell you in the most interesting way why I say no. When Mr. Adams died, Mr. Barra raised issues about it. And it was highlighted then that there were fundamental problems about how the Public Accounts Committee operated as far back as about 50 years ago. It has materially, well, it's changed a little bit, but we are not operating it, we're trying, but we're not operating it the way it should. It should operate as a break upon deficient ministerial government. In other words, it should be sitting to examine things being currently done by any government and reporting quickly to, so that you could censure or call to public attention something that is currently taking place, mm -hmm. which may or may not be in the public interest, but which the committee does not like. And when I say does not like, I mean which the committee does not rationally like. And therefore they report to Mr. Speaker, who then obviously deals with the matter because it can be debated on the floor of the House. Here we have public accounts committee sessions that may take place today. Um, and the members or the, 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 the chairman may be the leader of the opposition, but the committee is so late that in effect, the members of that committee, the majority members, are examining their own actions from the parliament before. That has happened. And that is not how it's intended to operate. And of course, this committee deals with the spending by government. And it's another technique to ensure that the public's money is properly spent. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that the money, um, no, let me put it this way. The money can be properly spent and legally and validly spent. But for example, one might not have had value for the money. That too can be examined by uh, um, a serious and, and modernized in terms of its capacity um, public accounts committee. The value for money approach is part of the enhancement of the public accounts committee, which our committee can look at. But the, the, the reason why I say I don't like how it's operating is because there is not a sufficient currency of operation because of all sorts of, um, all sorts of things that have happened in the past. Let's look at the structure of that particular committee. Who yes. serves on that committee? Um, members of the House. That's a general answer. It's a cop-out answer kind of thing, but members of the House. And the reason why I say members of the House is because the opposition is supposed to keep the government on its toes. That is the ethos, the original ethos. Mm -hmm. We have problems because of small parliaments and because at one stage, the committee depended for a quorum on the cooperation of the very government that it was examining. You with me? Of course. Good. The result was that if the member of the government absented himself from the meetings, you couldn't get a quorum so that the actions of his party could not be examined in a timely fashion. At that stage, it used to be 4-3. I can only speak of my experience as a past member of that committee. We had instructions from our prime minister at the time, Tom Adams, to make sure that we attended so that the opposition DLP could then have a quorum to get on with its business. Of course, myself and particularly Sir David Simmons attended. 
And on one occasion, he created a rampance, a fuss, because he said, look, we are telling, but the other side doesn't turn up. And if you know he's a very conscientious fella, his approach is we're here to do business. The prime minister's mandated us to be here to help the opposition form a quorum. We turn up dutifully and still can't get a quorum. That is actually recorded in the annals of uh, the Gazette, the official Gazette, because Simmons being the intensive character, he is raising on the floor of the house and said, you know. So the committee hasn't worked their efforts to make it work. But that is another of the problems, a small part of it. The official gazette, what is it? The, well, it's um, an official publication of the government. Its context or its connection here is that it contains the debates, which is the official record of the House. But it's all, it also contains other statutory advertisements which are necessary, probate matters and that sort of thing. For our purposes, you take a subscription, you get the actual recorded verbatim reports of the House. Now, the new session of Parliament um, yeah. has started with some amendments to our Constitution, the big story. Yeah. Those changes deal with the appointment of opposition senators where there is essentially no opposition and lowering the age so that 18-year-olds can right. sit in either House mm -hmm. of Parliament. We've heard the pros and we've heard the cons. What is your take on these amendments? First of all, I think we should lower the age to allow 18 year olds to become members of the Senate. Um, age discrimination, if you like, in reverse, or classic age discrimination. Um, in law, an 18 year old attains his majority. Mm -hmm. Anybody becomes 18, he can buy property, sell property, do anything. Um, he is, or she is, an adult for all purposes. Um, so that is a no-brainer. But that's not the one that is really controversial. The problem, I think, relates to the structure of our Constitution as it relates to a particular function of the leader of the opposition. Now, the leader of the opposition is located in the lower house. That, again, is another um, major constitutional um, part of our governance. The lead of the opposition is in the lower house, and he is by common consent and by tradition the chairman of the Public Accounts Committee. So you mm -hmm. can see how important yes. for a start his role is. He is there as a watchdog over the government. Yes. When you do not have a lead of the opposition, you have problems. Because I do not think that the constitution under the Westminster system, contemplates no person available to fill yeah. that post. And that is the problem we have now. Because if there's no person to fill that post, then you do not have a person in the f form of an elected politician to nominate the opposition senators for the upper chamber. Right. The debate has fastened because some people say that the president, the head of state, can appoint those um, senators. I think not. They said that that would demean the office of the president. Well, yes. Um, even if the president had that power, appointing senators, other than independent senators, is a possible hornet's nest because you are dealing with politicians. You're dealing with political force. Now, Choices are made, and politicians being what they are, they will disagree with some of those choices. And therefore, we need to know what can be done when you do not have a leader of the opposition. And you need to fill those two Senate positions within the framework of our Constitution. Take me through section 75, if you will, so that we could look at what is yeah. there at present and what is being changed. I, I have it with me. All we need to do is to just read carefully mm -hmm. the first three lines, which says, during an, any period in which there is a vacancy in the office of leader of the opposition, by reason of the fact that no person is, and this is a key word here, both qualified in accordance with the Constitution, 
That means no person is in the lower house. Mm -hmm. But hold on, that no person is both qualified and willing to accept appointment to that office. When you read those words carefully, they seem to me to say that somebody has to be there, ordinarily qualified, and willing. If there's no person ordinarily qualified and willing, it means that there's somebody qualified, but he's not, not willing. willing. Mm -hmm. Because that person has two major attributes, qualified and willing. If there's no such person, then you have a problem. And it is in those circumstances that the head of state can intervene. But here we have a different situation. We do not even have a person who is qualified. We have no leader of the up, we have no elected member in the lower house, mm -hmm. which seems to me to exclude any appointment of any opposition senators, even by the head of state. So our constitution never contemplated a situation like this? In my view, it never contemplated the situation. It never contemplated the situation. It contemplated the situation where there is a member who qualifies but is unwilling because the requirements for the operation of Section 75 are, as I read them, or the, the, the requirement is, because it's a composite requirement, that there is a person, but he's not willing. And therefore, the head of state acts like a tiebreaker right. for that kind of situation. But here we do not even have a person qualifying in the lower house. Now, I think the prime minister is right to take the advice of the attorney general. I, I am not, let me just make this, I'm not any of the advisors. I'm just using my own experience mm -hmm. and interpretation. But the constitution contemplates that prime ministers take advice from the um, uh, attorney, attorney general. general. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that advice appears to indicate that that section should be amended. I also think it should be amended. Explain the actual amendment for me, if you will. The amendment seeks to insert the view that in that kind of situation, we have no um, leader of the opposition, that you look to the reality of this situation. You look to the foundation of our political system, which though it does not mention political parties, is premised on members getting and securing votes. And the best way, in my view, to deal with that situation is to look to see who would normally have been in a position to qualify for leadership of the opposition. Mm -hmm. The leader of the opposition would normally come from the major party getting the next highest number of votes, the Democratic Labour Party, and to seek to amend Section 75 so as to permit that party to nominate the senators and to identify in the absence of a leader of the opposition or in the absence of a member qualifying to be leader of the opposition from that party to identify its political leader. Because in the absence of the leader of the opposition, certain other constitutional functions have to be um, dealt with. And therefore, in a spirit of cooperation to ensure the functioning of the constitution in the way in which it was intended, you would identify a political leader who could deal with those things or speak to those issues which the leader of the opposition would normally speak to. That is why it is fraught with difficulty because when you appoint senators and you identify a political leader, you're really getting into the nitty gritty of politics. And the appointment of the senators in and of itself may indicate in somebody's mind, other than the person who's appointing, a particular idea that this person is the leader. Mr. Ali, mm. you would have indicated the structure of the Senate. We have 12 government senators, mm. seven independent senators, and two opposition senators. Mm. Should the Senate of Barbados meet 
without having those two opposition senators? I think that the Constitution is made to function. And in the circumstances, the only way out of the conundrum is to have the Senate meet, notwithstanding the fact that two opposition senators are not there. Because in that way, you are able to amend the Constitution, if you can get the required number of votes, solve the problem, and continue with the governance. But we've got to go back and understand what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with a situation where there is, if you like, a permanent parliament. A permanent parliament. Parliament as an institution mm -hmm. has been established. Parliament as a functioning element operates in sessions and that is noted on the official gazette too. It operates in sessions. When those sessions are dissolved, the parliament still functions. And the idea that parliament has to be fully constituted because there can be no vacancies, I think is wrong. Because once there is a dissolution of parliament, there are vacancies. The lower house operates on the basis of writs which have to be returned to Her Excellency. The upper house does not operate on that basis. It operates on the basis of appointments to positions. And that is why Section 75 is so key, because the constitutional functionaries are prohibited by the Constitution from dealing with those two seats. One, because there's no lead of the opposition, and two, because there is no advice or nomination by the non-existent leader of the opposition to the head of state so that the head of state can, if you like, and I, I mean no demeaning of the officer by this, rubber stamp those nominations and have um, the Senate, and I have the two senators in place. The only method of breaking that conundrum is to recognize that the Senate can sit as it is, based on its requirements for a quorum, and that it can then proceed to recognize the problem that has existed and as its first order of business, move to correct it. Move to correct it. So they can sit. That is my view. And the notion that which I read this morning, that there's some Irish case dealing with this situation and that that Irish case solves the problem is, in my view, emphatically wrong. The Irish situation is totally and completely different from our situation. It is true that we're, both situations deal with the Senate, but in the Irish situation, the Senate is partly elected and partly nominated, and for different, completely different reasons. Partly nominated so that the Prime Minister can maintain some kind of support in the Senate because nobody can guarantee whether the government of the day would get support in the Senate if, as is the case, the Irish Senate is elected. That is totally different from our situation. The two things sound alike, but they're totally different, totally functionally different. Well, that was a very interesting first session, very educational, Mr. Ali. Thank you so much for joining us. That was Mr. Ezra Aline, a former deputy speaker of the House of Assembly and an attorney at law for more than 50 years. I'm Lisa Lord. This was One on One. Thank you so much for watching. Good evening.